busy time. But God is good. You know, I've shared this over the years. We all pine and seek revival, yet we don't think of the end of what happens when God's glory is poured out. And uh, it's, it's every night, seven days a week. Glory. Authority. Americans tend to believe that questioning or defying authority is our inalienable constitutional right. We resist most authority, even the concept of it. The very foundations of America are forged with the self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-made mentality of the uncorralled, individualistic, and rugged American pioneer, the settler, the cowboy, who didn't need anyone or anything other than a rifle, a horse, or some jerky. Americans absolutely rebel at the idea of submitting to anyone or anything. No one t this is American ex exceptionalism, isn't it? No one tells us what to do, not the UN, not Europe, and in some cases, not even our own government. Although not all of this is intrinsically bad when you consider who the UN and EU is and the corruption and deceit within our own government. In the greater body of Messiah in America, most congregants do not view the congregation as a place where one submits to leadership for the purpose of growth, maturity, and accountability. Most congregations are viewed as a spirituality or theology store where we search for good feelings and warm fuzzies. It's a place where you shop, select, and choose like a consumer would that is the best fit for you. If one likes the feel of a place and their immediate needs are met, friendly, receiving, warm, atmosphere, maybe even some good coffee or food with a safe and secure place to leave the kids, they'll come back. If some other congregation down the road or across town offers a more pleasant experience, has better food, better coffee, maybe a more stylish, hipper building, you take your family and business there. Many actually seek a place that fit their theology vice a congregation where the word is given in spirit and truth. The word being spoken, the message is of a nominal concern, relegated to an uplifting message or promise of better days ahead. The average congregate today wants to be pampered, not challenged beyond their comfort level. People are inundated these days with thousands of digital cable channels, hundreds, hundreds of streaming services now. Internet, smartphones, social medias, various sports and hobbies, shopping, and a whole host of various other endeavors. God becomes limited and packaged into a format that fits into our busy schedules and lifestyles without sacrificing our other interests. The whole feel-good, seeker-sensitive theology inhibits many congregational leaders today, rabbis, pastors, it's just semantics. It inhibits congregational leaders today from saying or speaking a word, a message, or a drosh with correction, with truth, or rebuke because it might offend or upset a congregate or their families, causing them to leave and move on to that nicer place down the street or across town where they're not challenged or made uncomfortable in their lifestyles and beliefs. In America, capitalism is the model that's prostituted the body. The congregate, the consumer, is king and always right. Congregational leaders feel they have no choice but to please the people in their respective boards because they're held accountable to a business plan or a budget that requires a shepherd to operate the congregation as a for-profit business. The dollar becomes the bottom line. This congregational model is an error and contradicts the kingdom of God, which is a theocracy that revolves around a heavenly king, not the individual. We're not a business or entertainment. I've shared this many times. This is a Roman-style hippodrome. Those who have come to Israel, when we, when we go to the Roman ruins, uh, the orator or the actor got up, and it was a half circle just in the Bet Midrash in the synagogue. That's not how this is set up. This is designed for me, the orator, you, the people, to be entertained as I'm up here. Then we have the European model that was established by Rome, which, by the way, is a sovereign ruling government, which was in time altered to the local monarchy if the nation became Protestant, i.e., Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth of England is also the head over the Church of England. The government and kingdom of God were merged as one with the state, dictating the fiscal operation and theology of the congregation. And so what we have then is that like in Nazi Germany, the swastika replaced the cross in all churches, and the clergy were ordered to preach the state's message or be sent to a concentration camp, and many were. 
With America's consumeristic ideology deeply embedded within each individual's psyche, the concept of spiritual authority and a person voluntarily submitting to that authority seems foreign to the average American. Hasatan breeds further fear among the sheep by elevating cultic wackos. Many of us remember Reverend Jimmy Jones down in Ghana drinking a Kool-Aid. Suicide, murder, over 900 followers back in the 70s. Or the Reverend David Koresh in Waco, Texas, who was a pedophile and a bigamist that led his entire flock to death in a standoff with the federal government. These are the extremes, but it does bring forth those who absolutely refuse to submit to any authority and will not in any way receive correction. Another significant factor that deals into all this is the rebellion against authority that we're battling from the 60s, which revolted against all authority. We're in that first generation after this disaster. We're feeling the effects of the first fruits on our society and morality. This confusion and divisiveness from the enemy leaves the congregate battered, bruised, and hurt, then bouncing from congregation to the next, or no congregation at all, with little to no relationship with God, who's the supreme authority and is contrary to Scripture. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 24, And let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spur each other on to love and good deeds. So right off the bat, this is the beauty of a congregation because we're here to pay attention to one another. I, I shared this some months ago, but I'm going to share it again because we recently just uh, reconvened and, and sent, talked on our uh, congregational list to make contact with everybody. Some people have moved, addresses have changed, numbers have changed. I'm glad we did this because now we're in hurricane season. You know, anything can happen. We want to be able to contact everybody. But we heard person after person after person. We actually had people call the office that they were your neighbors. And, you, and they found out that we were contacting you twice a week. Are you okay? Do you need prayer? Are there any, any products you need? If you need toilet paper, let us know. We've got things. We've got a shared pool of, of stuff. We're here to help each other. And we're getting feedback that many, many, many churches in the area, they're not contacted. They haven't talked to their congregants through the entire pandemic. Let alone ask if they have any needs or how they can help. And then they ask, can I get on your list? Well, no. It's not that we don't love you, but you know, wherever you're connected to, go back to that place. Go make a change or come here and join. That list would have been 5,000 had we succumbed to that. But, but it revealed the hunger and the desire of people to come together, to be in a healthy congregation. And we're getting feedback that their pastors, they're, they're not speaking to the, the predicament. They're not relevant. They're not speaking about what we're dealing with at hand. So this is two-sided. Authority both at the congregational level from the leaders and from the congregates. So we let us keep paying attention to one another to spur each other on to love and, and good deeds, actions. It's a result of our faith and trust in Yeshua. That's the end result of the gospel is to have action and go make what? Other disciples. Verse 25 says, not neglecting our own congregational meetings as some have made a practice of doing, but rather encouraging each other. And let us do this all the more as you see the day approaching. And it's approaching. First, we take care of each other. Miss Polka, the look out, protect, defend, and support one another, which are all aspects and benefits of submitting to and being part of a congregation. Second, we're told not to neglect the assembling, the congregating together. When the enemy gets you alone and out from under the protection and covering of congregational authority and structure, you're a solitary lamb in the field susceptible to being picked off by the wolves. The power of the congregation is in the congregate. The power of the congregate is within the congregation. The good news is that with all that we have with today's technology, listen, with all the Facebook Live, the live stream, the IG, uh, Instagram, our radio media, you can be a congregate here from anywhere in the world. I'll be the first to admit, we, we've traveled and we've watched, and it's not quite the same as sitting in here and having it live. However, it's revolutionizing congregational meetings and gatherings. We're here and available for the handicapped, shut-ins, elderly, remote family who don't have a Messianic congregation in their area yet. The old brick-and-mortar mega congregations may just may be becoming a thing of the past. Though we'll always need a sanctuary, a platform, a foundation to host services and broadcast from, it's critical to connect to and submit to congregational authority because you can't move in and operate in kingdom authority if you can't submit to congregational authority. Let me say that again. That was a mouthful. 
it's critical that we connect and submit to a congregation because you can't move in and operate in kingdom authority if you cannot submit to congregational authority. This is a grave issue. And here's why. The greater body is no longer a voice of authority in our nation. You know, 100 years ago, if you wanted to make a dynamic change in your nation, if you wanted to be a voice for the voiceless, you become a pastor, you become clergy. That's not how it is anymore. It's hard to believe just 60 years ago with the civil rights, who led that? Uh, pastors? The abolition movement in the North to end slavery, who, who led that? Uh, pastors? Who brought about our release from English rule and tyranny? The Black Robe Regiment, fiery pastors. Matter of fact, most of the Declaration of Independence was, were taken from sermons that were preached years before we issued that decree, documenting the tyranny and the unjustness of what the king was doing over us. But somehow something shifted. We're no longer that voice of authority. We're even in our nation or even around the world when we should be. God has established a biblical pattern of authority that he himself is the head of. In Psalms 82, verse 1, a psalm of Asaph, God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the judgment, on the judges. So there, there's a heavenly court. God is king. He's the judge. And that's the ultimate authority. In the end, every one of us will stand in that court. Every one of us. Your spouse won't be there. Your kids, your parents, your rabbi, you'll be there and have to give an account of your own life before the king. This is important because we work for a king who has delegated authority to you so that you may act on his behalf, his direct ambassador. This is how a congregational leader operates, as a representative of the king. We're to encourage and rebuke in authority, as it says in Titus 2.15. These are the things you should say. Encourage and rebuke with full authority. Don't let anyone look down on you. Congregants are told to submit to congregational leadership in Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your lives as people who have to render an account. So make it a task of joy for them, not one of groaning, for that is of no advantage to you or me. Amen. Amen. Reference to leadership in scriptural is plural. Why? And why am I even talking about this? Is, am I dealing with a specific issue in the congregation? No. What we're dealing with is a powerless, spiritless, greater body of Messiah that is too temperate, too scared to stand up in the face of adversity and speak truth to the current situation. And this is part of the congregate's issue, and it's part of the leadership issue. So we've got to restore true... You know the only thing that will make Jezebel flee? True biblical authority. Jehu, true biblical authority. Remember, she got all dolled up and batted her eyes, and hey, Jehu, he said to the eunuchs, throw her out. <laughs> Reference in Scripture to leadership is plural. Why is that? Because God has established a chain of command, levels of leadership and accountability throughout the kingdom. Ephesians 4, verse 11 says, Furthermore, he gave some people as emissaries, some as prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news, some as shepherds and teachers. So we see he's got a plan here. Emissaries are the apostolic covering. Paul was an emissary. He was an apostle. Prophets are those given the prophetic gift. Proclaimers are those with the evangelical gift. Shepherds are the congregational leaders and teachers are those working within the body to teach and make Talmudim disciples. This is the model and the format, whether the meeting is hosted at home, online, in a synagogue, or even at a mega congregation. There can only be one congregational authority. There can only be one rabbi, one pastor. I've witnessed this so many times over the years. Congregations. I've been to these places where they've got dual leadership. Well, who are you? Well, I'm the guy that gives the messages. Well, who's that? That's the pastoral shepherd. What's that person do? Takes care of congregates' needs. Then what's this person? That's the business pastor. So who has the final say in the congregation? They just look at you. There was a young Messianic congregation south of us that someone we knew had been invited to come down here and be the leader. And so talking about this, I asked him, you know, what's the style down there? Well, I would be the person that just gives the messages. 
just stay away from me. It's a disaster waiting to happen. Every congregation I've ever interfaced with that has a mixed model ship leadership in place, not one single person have any authority, every one of those has failed. It doesn't work. Listen, when we first started as a congregation 21 years ago, it's hard to believe, but there was 15 or 20 of us in it. One or two of you were here then. Just a small handful. And I think they were all recovering Baptists. Because they all sat in the back. I thought, hey, you, Lord bless you. And, it's, and then one night even said, hey, man, everybody, see, you can't infringe on free will. We've learned so much in 20 years. I said, man, everybody just get up and move down front. Everyone just sat there. Or not. Just stay back there. <laughs> Fine with me. I'll just shout louder. This is probably half the reason why, you know, because for the six years, everyone back there. When we first started 21 years ago, I was approached by several different individuals that wanted to establish that here. They kept having meetings. Hey, hey Rabbi, what we should do is, I love this, this is what we should do, okay. You do this now, then next week I'll do this, and the next week I'll, this other person will do that. I'm like, mm, no. No? Yeah, no. See, because I had a radical road to Damascus encounter 22 years ago. And from that is this. And so the Lord did many things over the years I've done that the Lord didn't tell me to do. And, and we're learning to get rid of those things and to hone them out. The path from here to there is a straight line, but as human beings do, we tend to go back and forth over that path. But the Lord didn't tell me in these three days to have a multi-leadership model. He didn't say to share this. He said, go do this, this, and this. And so now, as we've gone farther into this, even more am I more convicted to do just this. I've spent so many times with so many leaders over the years that have had so many visions, and they're grand visions, and I know for a fact they were from God. But they don't do what God told them to do. They want to go into committee. They want to form up study groups. They want to invest. In, no, just do what God told you to do. Well, if we did this or do that, no, don't do that. Please, for the love of God, don't do that. Do what God tells you to do. We've even experienced this in the not too distant past, just recently. A person joined here. They wanted to have congregational meetings in their home, call that person pastor, and invite congregants from here to go there. I'm like, no. No. Well, but we're just, no. And then, then I found out, you know, of course, the doctrines and theologies are contrary to the Scripture, to the Messianic movement. It just, you know, it just keeps getting worse and worse. I could bore you with another 15 of these tales. It's probably more than that. But you, you start to get the principle here. When God does something, and there's something of value, somebody else wants it. That's part of being a shepherd, is the guide to protect and to keep the wolves out. You know, as soon as Moses is delivering us from Egypt, who pops out of this? His own sister and brother. His own sister and brother. See, it, it comes in all forms. He gets through that scenario. Who comes next? Korach. Korach, the next morning, now we got 250 leaders who are men of renown in Israel. When there's something of value, when God is moving, there's always someone in the wings seeking to destroy it. Nehemiah had his... Sanvalat and Tobias. I could keep going on and on. Paul had his Barnabas. You, you, you see, it's all throughout Scripture. My last scenario that quickly disintegrated. It was out of order. When the first Jerusalem council met to discuss how to deal with the Gentiles, this, this is, it's, it just seems so funny when we read this stuff. Because we go back 2,000 years ago, for the first 10 to 12 years, this was exclusively Messianic Jewish. Really, until Acts chapter 10 and 11, Cornelius and, and Caesarea, this was the first time Gentiles are actually, A, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and B, now coming in droves to the faith. But that Shavuot, that Pentecost that happened 2,000 years ago, that upper room, all Jews. In the temple, that 3,000 that got saved that day, all Jews. So now it's, it's funny to be here 2,000 years later and we're reading what we're going to do about the Gentiles coming in. Now the big discussion is what we're going to do with these Jews. 
that aren't doing Sunday and Christmas and Easter. What do we do with these guys? But th there's this group discussion followed by Acts 15, verse 13, where Yaakov broke the silence to reply, brothers, he said, here's what I have to say. From there, we know he issued the letter, the founding threshold or metric to bring the Gentiles in, stop from these four things. That's not the only four things. He goes on to say, because the Torah of Moses is taught every week in synagogue. Yaakov, James, Yeshua's brother, was the leader. Listen, there was no council, no board, no assembly, no advisory group. There was no committee, no legislative body involved. We see one leader among the Talmudim 2,000 years ago. This is not to say that there isn't accountability or oversight. There is. That's the very reason why we're members of the IMCS and the MJA. We've got accountability board here. Every congregation must have a covering. Sid Roth told me 25 years ago, be wary of the person or the work that has no covering. It's a wolf. And we've had them here over the years. Hey, who are you? I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. Who are you with? Oh, God just sent me. Never worked out, not once. There was and is no democracy in the kingdom of God. The Talmudim of Yeshua didn't vote on the situations. They discussed the issues among themselves, and Yaakov made the decision what to do regarding the Gentiles coming into the congregation, how to proceed. See, Scripture doesn't allow us the opportunity to pick and choose a congregation that fits into your understanding or philosophy, your views on life or politics. There, there's not a, a pro-abortion church or a pro-life church. There's just the Word of God. There's not black churches or white churches. There's just the Word of God. There's not Jewish and Gentile. It's just the Word of God. The gospel doesn't conform to your box. We're to conform to the kingdom. If you're not in a place where you're being challenged to change and conform to God's word and kingdom with good, strong leadership, then you're in the wrong place. I'm singing to the choir here. This is for the media and how it's going out. In those places, many people are hurt at those places, which result in alleged defense, hurt, or spiritual bruising, which is the major reason for their future refusal to submit to any authority anywhere. The enemy knows exactly what he's doing. On the other hand, many don't commit because they refuse to conform to the kingdom and the word. Again, if I wrote a book regarding recording all this stuff, we've encountered experience within the body, few would believe it. I've learned not to let a new person who just comes here talk poorly about where they came from and their congregational leader. We were pretty naive when we started 21 years ago. I'd sit there and listen for an hour. Blah, 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 they need to do this, they need to do that, blah, 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 blah. And then I, I, you know, I quickly learned three years from now, that, that's me. Now they're at the next place. Oh, it's a stupid rabbi that just screamed and hollers at it. <laughs> it's been years since that happened. You know, I come from this place and he was no good. I just stop right now. You go back and fix it with that person. You either agree to disagree, you know, but how you end is going to reveal how you start at, at the next place. Is there a times and season to move on? Yes. Is there a lot of places out there that are just a whitewashed facade? Yes. Denying the power, but looking religious. Yes, they're everywhere. So I'm not saying you should just unthinking compliance and just stay where you're at. But don't leave there in the hot, bruised, or hurt, because you, you'll bring it to the next place. Amen. People that have attended four or five congregations in seven or eight years, well, what's the common denominator there? Them. It's important to be healed and submit to a congregation and learn how to be in a healthy family. Not perfect, but healthy, because there's a difference. There's no perfect family. And if there was, you wouldn't be in it anyways. Remember, even leaders are human and flesh. We fall short, so don't put us on pedestals. Anybody that's been here for any length of time, you, you've heard me come up here and apologize and repent for things I've said, wrong theologies and doxologies, things that even I brought into this that we find out over time, oh, that's, it's wrong. Let's get back to Titus 2.15. These are the things you should say. Encourage and rebuke with full authority. 
Don't, anyone, don't let anyone look down. Perifronio, which despise, look down, treat you with contempt, deprecate or disparage on you. This is interesting. Read closely. Listen, Shaul, Paul isn't saying, don't let anyone disregard the word you spoke. Shaul carefully states, don't let anyone look down on you. Don't let them deprecate you. Don't let them disparage you. Don't let anyone despise you or treat you with contempt to neglect you, mistreat you, or treat you with indifference. That advice is not written to just Titus, but to the entire Messianic community. Without a doubt, Shaul Paul's intention is clear that people are not to disregard, despise, look down, treat with contempt, deprecate, or treat with indifference Titus and his message. This also applies to today's message giver. Shaul, with great wisdom and discernment, displayed a clear grasp of human nature and authority within the greater body. People have a tendency to refute rebuke or reject a message that convicts or challenges their reality, which they tend to regard as truth, which is not the case. We're, we're abounding in this gender confusion nonsense. I saw an article just today of a woman testifying that she's a lesbian and has been a Christian for 15 years, and that's compatible. Well, that must be in the book of Hezekiah. Because I can't find that passage in my Bible. But see, that, that's conforming the kingdom of God into her reality, which is a falsehood. But yet, it's not just her. It's common among people. Matter of fact, people will go place to place to place to find that congregation that will fit their theology and belief system. The Word of God is meant to get people out of their reality and their false truth and to change as individuals, to stop sinning and conform to the kingdom of God. This is and not the world. This is that biblical worldview. We must look at the world through the veil, through the eyes, through the shades of the Scripture. I don't have a political belief. I have Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. And what I do must reconcile to that. That's the core foundation of the gospel. Yet the flesh revolts against this. This is compounded and made worse when entire organizations feel threatened. We'll take the same course of action. People don't have the chutzpah to reject the message if it's directly from Scripture. What they'll do instead is negate the intent of the message by disregarding or looking down upon the messenger who brought it, nullifying the message. If the messenger exhorts, reproves, or brings correction to an individual or the body from the Word, those who seek to subvert the message will attack the message giver by saying, who, who, who does he think he is? Do you know that comes from Scripture? That was Moses' sister and brother. Who does he think he is? That's what Korach said to Moses and Aaron. Who do they think they are? God only speaks to them? I mean, this is right from Scripture. What right does he have to speak to us this way? What's important of all this? Why, why am I even sharing this tonight? Well, that respect and submission to authority, a person is in rebellion and left without accountability and covering. This understanding goes way beyond the congregation level. This, this has been years ago, maybe 16 or 17 years ago, there was a person here who clearly, clearly had issues with authority. And several weeks in a row after the service, catch me out there in the, in the lobby and just start coming at me, berating me. Dude, what, you know, Let's go into the office. We're not doing this out here. And so I said, what's the problem? Oh, you know, you blah, 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 blah. And I'm just blunt. Well, then why do you keep coming back? He said, well, because God is here and he's moving. <laughs> what? McFly, what? Hello? <laughs> if I'm what he says I am, then how in the world could God be here and moving? There'd be no presence of God here. That's how you know when something's right, the presence departs. That was David. Oh, God, do not let your presence depart from me. That's how we knew something was happening during the first diaspora, right? Because the presence of God departed from the temple. All the priests knew it. 
He's no longer here. This was the key for Isaiah. As long as the presence of God is here, y'all got nothing to worry about. Oh, look at all these armies. Isaiah would be so cool. Yeah, what, oh, what, what, yeah. God can take care of this. His presence is right here. It's when that presence departs. Then there's grave danger. I'm going to say this again. The kingdom is comprised of servant leaders. If you're unable to submit under authority, you'll never have kingdom authority working through you. It won't be given to you because you don't know how to submit. Listen, in Matthew 8, there's this Roman army officer, right, who pleads with Yeshua to heal his orderly who was paralyzed and doing really poorly. And Yeshua says, okay, let's go. And the officer says, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm unfit to have you come to my house. You just say it, and he'll be healed. He said, because I, too, am a man under authority. I tell this one, go, he goes. I tell this one, come, and he comes. I tell them, do this, they do it. Yeshua, Yeshua was like, Phew. he's like, I've never seen such trust in all Israel like this man. Now, Yeshua didn't say authority, he said trust. I want you to catch his parallel. That submission to authority builds the trust in the person. Yeshua commanded it. His orderly was supernaturally healed. That, that's something that's lost on most people. The submission to authority, the understanding of it, is how you build trust within you. If you really understood who Yeshua is, you'll know that full authority is with you and can be in you, but only if you submit. Too many in the greater body, they, they want a title, but they're unwilling to submit to authority and be patient. Remember, Joshua was Moses' loyal number two for 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. I shared this once about seven or eight years ago. Probably one of the most life-changing life events for me was when I broke my pelvis 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Bedridden for three months. Horrible. But prior to that time, we'd been involved with, you know, Road to Jerusalem, Promise Keepers, the, our movement, the, the conferences, the, you know. And uh, I, used to, I used to think, I used, used to think this, man, they should put me up there because I'd bring the fire. Do all these events, I'm, I'm never engaging. I'm like, man, psh, come on. I want my crack, give me the crack. Then I started having these life things begin to happen. And it became readily apparent that A, there's some pride working in here. And B, I'm not ready. And as God brought me through this transformative season, something shifted. It radically shifted. And those of you that were here, you know. We have nothing of the old stuff prior to 2010. I got rid of it all. All of it. Junk. Because this was wrong. Yes, he called me. Yes. But then I got in it. And once I got out of it, things started to happen. A year and a half after that event, I, I get a phone call. Hey, we want you to come be a main stage speaker at the Maasai Conference for the YMJA night. I, I said no. I said, what? See, three years ago, I'd have given anything to get that call. Now they make the call. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not your guy. There's far, far too many profound anointed speakers out there far better than me. I'm not your huck. It took three calls until I finally relented. You see where this is going? The less I want it, the more it comes. There must be humility in all that we do. As Yeshua shared in the wedding parable, Luke 14, starting in verse 8, he said, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit down at the best seat. Because if there's someone more important than you who has been invited, that person who invited both of you might come and say to you, hey, give this man your place. 
then you'll be humiliated as you go back to take the least important place. Instead, when you're invited, go and sit at the least important place so that when that one who invited you comes, he'll say to you, hey, come on up to a better seat. Then you'll be honored in front of everyone sitting with you. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I know it firsthand. A no one tells me what to do person doesn't have a relationship with that or I who issues edicts and commands. You catch that? It's non-existent. The West, particularly America, which means us in here, have a bold, strong streak of severe independence, which leads people to rebel against God. We cry out to God concerning an issue, and when he responds or replies, if it's not in the venue or vision we see it in, we then reject it. And then we're, we're bruised and angry at God because he didn't do it our way. I had several associates that had situations like these, didn't do what God told them, told them to do, and then it failed. And then they're, they're raving mad. They're mad at me. Because God told them to do some things that were Jewish. I'm not involved in it. They just shared it with me. Oh, man, that's a profound revelation. I'd do it and quick. But then they don't do it. And then when it fails, guess who they're mad at? The Jew. Because what they were told to do was supposed to look like this, and when it failed, it's my fault. Then, of course, they're out of his will. And so things just get even worse. And it aggravates the bruising, the, the crushing spirit, creating even more anger and rebellion on the part of the individual. It's just a downward spiral. Again, that's how Korah got started. He said, oh, you take too much on yourselves. After all, the entire community is holy, isn't it? Every one of them. And Adonai is among them, so why do you lift yourself up above Adonai's assembly? Wow. And rebellion just loves company. Those 250 men, men of reputation, they're not rabble-rousers. Korak had managed to get 250 leaders, key members of Moshe's council. These were men of reputation. Be so careful regarding what you question. And your response, even your body language, regarding how you receive something from authority. Just because you don't understand it, receive it or agree with it, doesn't mean that it's not from God. You know, the divine mentor we've been reading, Ezekiel, for the last several weeks. Boy, is that a weird chapter. The prophetic's weird. It's spirit and truth, but it's weird because it's out our, outside our confines of understanding. Lay on your side for this long, representing this amount of judgment. Cook your food over human dung fire. Whoa, whoa, wait, what? Make Ezekiel bread. Sorry, some of you love it. Then these things with four wheels and eyes, right? And a human head, an eagle head, and a lion head. Just because it's strange to you doesn't mean it's not of God. Even those who absolutely refuse to submit and have been counseled according to Matthew 18... Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 through 13, For what business is it of mine to judge the outsiders? Isn't it those who are part of the community that you should be judging? God will judge those on the outside. Expel the evildoer from among yourselves. I can tell you it's one of the hardest calls to make in leadership. We, we've done it here only a handful of times, but we've, we've done it. Because you know this is where that person needs to be. God can heal, restore, and set them free. But if they can't do it without destroying 20 of you, they're not going to do it here. Because if it's not done, that rebellion spreads like cancer. If they overcame their own pride to repent, they're welcome back. If not, 
Go to that fancy coffee place down the road. This brings me all the way back to where I started. This whole scenario prevents most clergy today, rabbis, pastors, and semantics leadership, who are tempted to grow their kehillahs or their congregations from saying or speaking a word, a statement, or a message of correction or rebuke that just might offend or upset a congregate or their children. A couple of things I've read this week, stunning. Another recent study interviewed 3,100 Americans, ages 18 to 55, just last year, reveals an even more critical, severe drop in a biblical worldview. It went from 32% in 2010 to 16% in 2020. In 10 years, those who have a biblical worldview are cut in half. Now, we're start, not starting with 80 or 90%. We're starting with only 32% to begin with, and now that's down to 16%. An even newer study I just read this morning states that only 6% of believers today believe the Holy Spirit is real. So the percentage of born-again believers with a biblical worldview has been cut in half over the last decade. That study compared 18 to 29-year-old age group from 2010. They took that same group 10 years later who are now 30 to 39. The result is a startling degradation in worldview beliefs of born-again believers over just 10 years. These disturbing trends, there's two sides of this. As believers, you can mine anything on your smartphone or your computer or your iPad. Because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. And so the more, the, the more you're immersed in this, then you begin believing the lie, oh, I was born this way. Well, maybe they are. If God's a God of love, then isn't that love? See, that's that little snippet, that little lie from the enemy. The other half of this disturbing trend is due to clergy not consistently teaching biblical truth in spirit and in truth. So half the onus is on the people, half the onus is right here. This is so critical because we're truly in the end days. We're running out of time. And every time I read one of these statistical reports, it just the news just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But we have to understand, this didn't start three weeks ago. This has been going on for 60, 70 years. Willow Creek outside of Chicago started the whole seeker-sensitive thing 30-some years ago. The pastor who started that, who was retired, he wrote in Charisma Magazine a couple of years ago. It was the most stunning, transparent article I ever read. He said, the whole thing failed. He said, see, we could fill the pews, but nobody was discipled. See, the, the gospel doesn't tell us to fill every seat. The gospel commands that we make Talmudim. And those two philosophies are diametrically opposed. There's dozens of football stadiums across this country that seat 70, 80, 90, 150,000 people, and they're full every week. Sold out every week. But God's not glorified in that. God's glorified by the fruit that you bear. God's glorified by your submission to his authority. God's glorified by your coming to know Yeshua, by your being filled with the Holy Spirit, by your sharing that and replicating yourself. With the, sheep make sheep. I said it the other night, sheep make sheep. But you can't move in kingdom authority unless you submit to authority. You can't give what you don't have. Let's rise. Let's pray.
we, Rabitz and myself, the staff, we thank you for your loyalty. It's busy in these fall feasts. It's easy to get tired. It's easy to say, man, I've been here three times already this week. God honors the sacrifice. The fire always falls on the sacrifice. Expect great things this Sukkot. Expect a supernatural. I am. Abba Father, in Yeshua's name, I thank you for your word to us this evening. I believe you're raising up sound, strong congregations in these end days that know how to divide the truth, that are spirit-filled, that will stand in the face of adversity and speak truth no matter the consequences. We live in a woke culture, a cancel culture, that if what we say is contrary to what someone else thinks, we're shamed into silence. Father, forgive us for that. Forgive us for succumbing to this cancel culture. It's, it's global, Father, not just here. We will not be silent. We will not rest until Jerusalem is restored. Until all Israel is saved. Until we hear Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Until we come together as Jew and Gentile to bring the state of national tranquility. Shalom, Irene. We will not be silent. We will stand up for the voiceless. We will stand up for racism and hatred and anti-Semitism. We will not be silent. We will speak out against immoral behavior that doesn't reconcile to your word. Oh God, we will not be silent. We will not pander to sin. We will not be intimidated by the sinful of this land. If you be for us, who can be against us, oh God? Father, I'm praying for boldness this evening. For an infilling of your Holy Spirit and everybody here, everybody that's watching and listening to this, Father God. We're praying for a shift in the culture. We're praying for a shift in the body of Messiah. I'm praying, Abba Father, that you would raise up godly leadership that would throw Jezebel out the window. And they will not be prideful. We'll be humble before you, but our warriors who will not be silent. Oh God, raise up an army. Prepare us, oh God, for the time and season to come. And truly make us echad, make us one. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. And amen. I'm going to ask Joshua tonight to just release the ironic benediction over us. We've done more repenting in the last month than we have in the last two years. Monday at sunset is Zaman Simkatenu, the season of our rejoicing. So we're, we're going to shift now. We've made it through the fast. You lived. You made it. Some were grumpy, Paul Dorn, but we made it. And had God encounters at the mikvah. So beautiful to see everyone dressed in white. But your names remain. Now we're going to the wedding feast. It's time. Shabbat Shalom. Yevarechadonai, <laughs> 
Bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. Shabbat shalom.